Welcome to this um, event, Climate Justice and Extractive Economic Policies in Latin America and the Caribbean. My name is Patsy Lewis, and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at Brown University. This lecture is part of a, a group of a number of activities we're having on this topic that is funded by the Dean of Fac Dean of Faculty Lectureship Series under the Charles P. Sisson II Memorial Lectureship Fund. And uh, next week, Tuesday at 5 p.m., we have the second um, installment in our series, which is a talk by James Fletcher on the climate crisis and small island developing states, the case for climate justice. And uh, Jim was a minister in the St. Lucian government, a minister for public service, information, broadcasting, sustainable development, etc. And he has also been instrumental in pressing the case at the, um, in the, for, for getting in the Paris Treaty a commitment to keep global warming at 1.5 degrees above industrial levels. So he's very much involved in act activism around global warming and the challenges that small states face. But that's not our focus today. Our focus today is um, on the extractive sectors and how these in Latin America and the Caribbean and how these um, impinge on climate justice. And there is a strong focus in our activity today, activities today on, the, on indigenous communities. We start off with a film by filmmaker Dr. Esther Figaro, who is sitting here, um, which you should have seen. It's called Fly Me to the Moon. And it's a tour de force. It, it's a film about the global um, bauxite industry. So it's not just the Caribbean, but there are some common themes that resonate across the globe. The connections with colonialism, with unequal power, balance of power between um, states, of a very unequal sector in terms of who it benefits, who are the elites that benefit from its, its byproducts, and who are the ones who are disenfranchised. So we're talking about the movement of people off lands and the social and economic effects on their health, the shift to, from agriculture and ways in which people sustain their li livelihoods to the elevation of uh, the removal of earth, bauxite, and its replacement, its so-called replacement, but um, by an infertile, large infertile landscape. So central to this um, exploration is the question of inequality, government complicity. I mean, there are so many different themes that we can draw from it. So it sets a wonderful tone for the rest of um, our events today. So we'll start off by me having a discussion with um, Dr. Figaro, and then we'd have opened it up for questions and comments to her. Then we have, we move into our first panel, which is from 11.30 to 1 p.m., Extractivist Sectors and Challenges of Alternative Energy. And then we have a short lunch break, and we'll be providing lunch for those of us here. From 1 to 1.30, we start again at 1.30 and we end at 3. And the second panel is Climate Adaptation, Alternative Strategies and Perspectives. So before I, I start um, that conversation, I just want to thank you all for being here. A thank you to Esther Figaro for taking the time to come physically. Thank you to those of us um, in the room especially Mimi and William, who came from Worcester um, Polytechnic. Uh, it's great to have you guys here, and of course our in-house in um, 
stalwarts, Geronimo, Luis, and, and the rest of you um, in the room. And thank you for those of us, of you online, who have joined us this morning. So, I will now sit with, with Esther. Well, look at you, I can man no, I can't manage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, since I've briefly um, gone over the film, is there anything else before I, I, you know, we begin the discussion that you wanted to add about the film and what you want people to take away from the film? Well, I'll explain why I made it and mm -hmm. when we, we, we bring it up today. But first, I um, really wanted to thank you. We've been talking about this, having this kind of seminar for a while. And I'm very grateful to be here and to have the film streamed. And thanks to Kate and Emily and everybody else who has been part of the labor that put this together because um, I'm very excited about hearing everybody else and what they have to say. So um, I can give you a little background on why we made, I made the film. It's, it's part of ongoing work that I've been doing in Jamaica. Um, ah, no, still too bright, sorry. It's, um, it's part of ongoing work that I, I've been doing in Jamaica with communities that are impacted by bauxite mining and aluminum refining and other forms of extractivism, including tourism and um, quarrying and other types of prospecting and mineral um, and, you know, basic destruction and ecocide and the kind of relationship between justice for humans and justice for the non-humans as well, right? So what happened was um, I returned to Jamaica in 2006 and when I was, I was living in Hawaii for 25 years and that's where I began my media career, M it, primarily working um, with indigenous issues and with indigenous people and um, basically counter narratives. So when I came to Jamaica, for years before, in fact, I see Brian is here. I met with Brian. We talked about maybe doing an archive of Caribbean thought. I met with other people. I was trying to figure out what I would do when I came home, and I decided that this question of the environment and environmental, um, the relationship between people and um, the world, the rest of the world, and this notion of justice would be my focus. So I had met with Dana McCauley, who is head of Jamaica Environment Trust, which is one of the, the main um, environmental organizations in Jamaica. And I told her I was a filmmaker and I would make films for free. And she said, oh, I can keep you in business for the rest of your life. And I thought we would have a conversation, a typical conversation you have with organizations, short term, middle term, long term, goals, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, there was a crisis. What happened was the word went out that um, prospecting licenses had been given in a part of Jamaica called the Coptic Country. This is a quite large part region in Jamaica in the western interior of the island that provides up to 40% of our um, fresh water. Um, it's one of our last remaining intact forests, so it's very important for temperature, and um, all the things that we need for, that forests provide. Um, it's culturally very important. It's the home of the, um, the Maroons that live on that side of the island that fought the British and have their own treaty that made them have a certain type of sovereignty long before Jamaica became independent. Um, and it's a place of African continuities. Um, and also um, a, a rural and agricultural heritage. So it has indigeneity, it has um, um, so-called peasant culture, et cetera. It's a very, very important place. So a kind of panic went up, and all sorts of different people, from large landowners to small farmers to environmentalists to scientists, um, all banded together to try and stop this. Um, and so Dana came back to me and said, you know, we have to make a film um, as part of this effort. 
So I made a film called Cockpit Country Voices from Jamaica's Heart, and this was a short from 2007. And Jet um, had a sponsor, and it was aired um, primetime. And the outrage that it immediately um, followed made the Minister of Mining say, which he was the first Minister of Mining to say this, and every consequent Minister of Mining has said it, there will be no mining in cockpit country. So then what followed was this definition of where is cockpit country. So this question of borders and, and um, borderlines, and um, there were all these studies. Um, the efforts to protect cockpit country had been going on for, se for uh, generations. It had started probably in the 40s. Um, there were some forest reserve protections, and there were at least six boundaries that had been defined by different types of people for different purposes. So um, those of you who have seen the film, who I think are probably maybe half of you in the room, um, know that it reaches the point where the prime minister declares a protected area. And this protected area is um, a part of Coptic country and mysteriously um, excludes all the licenses, all the bauxite licenses that have been given. And in other words, a protected area in no way impacts the industry. So all the places where they would be mining anyway and where they already have prospecting and um, mining licenses are outside of the protected area. And the protected area has no buffer zone. So I'm currently making a film called um, Borderline Justice. Um, it's part of a project um, with a um, Swedish academic, um, Marie Vanergaard, and um, looking at this question of borders, because the more you protect one area, the more other areas that become sacrifice zones, or the more pressure is put on sacrifice zones. Okay, before we, before we sure. elaborate on, on the future, I just want to go back mm -hmm. um, to the film. I think one of the things that, that really struck me about it is that it's a global story. It's um, connected in ways in which we, we don't think about Jamaica and Bauxite being connected. Um, the aircraft, I mean, the space industry, the military industrial complex, and not to talk about just, you know, construction, you know, utilities, you know, or mixing bowls, the things we use in the kitchen. But so it's, it's very global. But of course, Jamaica is, I mean, I've lived in Jamaica, it's very close to me. And the film looks a lot at activism in Jamaica. And which is very powerful because you see ordinary people coming out in very eloquent language, speaking about the, the effects, the economic effects, you know, the ways in which um, agriculture and their ability to sustain themselves has been devalued, the ways in which they've just, you know, thrown off the land, the, the, the health issues they have. And you left the film you left us with the minister declaring the cockpit country free of mining. And you mentioned that, but that doesn't, there's a kind of nebulousness about what is protected and what is not. Can you bring us up to date with what is the current situation in Jamaica now? Right, yeah, so that's where I was getting. So, so there was this um, question of defining the boundaries. And so the government defined a boundary um, they did what was called truthing, so they went around and um, mapped exactly where the boundary is. They put, this was money from the um, European Union, by the way, money that was to go to the forestry department. And they went around and they put, um, you know, every few places they have these markers that define the boundary. And... Um, in the film, as main, mentioning borderline justice, I have someone standing and he says, my left foot is in cockpit country and my right foot isn't. What that means is you can mine or do anything you want right up to the boundary. 
So Patsy was mentioning um, the different efforts by the community um, uh, that I've been, I've been part of both organizing those efforts and documenting them. So these are communities who organized um, and who basically performed all the types of civic um, engagement that you're told to do in so-called liberal democracies. So they petition, they protest, um, they went, we even had a march on parliament, they met with parliamentarians, they got the word out to the media, um, you know, they let it be known in all the ways that, you know, you're told to let it be known, um, to have your voice heard, including we have bogus environmental impact assessments, right? So we have this process of bogus process of consultation. So for the, the, the current, the, the most recent lease, which is called Special Mining Lease 173, which is, um, this, I, will, I will explain, is the subject of two constitutional law cases, which I will explain, bringing it up to date. There was a consultation process where, of course, they went into the community and, you know, everyone, they kept assuring you that everything you said was being verbatim recorded and was going to be taken into, you know, as part of the consultation process. And everyone said, we don't want mining, here is why, you know, um, and completely ignored, everything completely ignored, right? So you have a bogus consultation process. So the community, everyone says, you know, people are don't participate. No, everyone participated in all the ways you're supposed to participate, and it made no difference, okay? They were mined, okay? One of the main places I've been documenting and where the people organized, and it's in, in the film, is a place called Gibraltar, and they mined right up to the gate of the school, okay? The children were ill, the teachers had to, several teachers left, it's the, the kind of destruction that, that, that takes place, okay? You destroy the land, the livelihoods of the people who are farmers, you make the people ill, there's no running water, water is catchment, so they don't have clean water, right? You take away all the trees, there used to be trees where people could go and gather fruits, there's none of that, okay? You, be completely, you become completely dependent and you have to leave. So for the first time, after all these different efforts were made that none of them made any different, for the first time, there have been two new approaches. One is a legal approach, um, and so we have two constitutional cases that will be heard in November, and I will explain why they're constitutional, and there are other constitutional cases that are being also in the pipeline. Um, and then there was a human rights approach. So we went to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights because Jamaica is part of the Organization of American States and this is part of, they have a commission and they have a, a court. And we, we asked to be heard for a hearing. We were denied the first time, they told us to reapply. We reapplied and we became the first Caribbean entity. We had the first hearing in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on extraction in the Caribbean. And we included Jamaica, Haiti, the Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, and Guyana. Um, so the commissioners heard everyone presenting on what was going on, and you're going to hear from Immaculata Casimiro from Guyana, indigenous people who are being impacted drastically by gold mining in particular. You will be hearing from her later. Um, so everyone spoke about the different extractive issues. The commissioners listened um, and made recommendations. And then later, the next step that is open in the Inter-American Commission process is called precautionary measures. This is when you apply to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and you say, people are in imminent danger. So land defenders or people who are, um, are you know, um, in imminent danger of death or fear for their life or their health, et cetera. 
So precautionary me measures were, um, uh, we appealed for precautionary measures to the commission. Um, everything takes a long time. Um, they granted those precautionary measures, which means they then get in touch with the government of Jamaica and they say, this is impacting these people in this way. They make certain recommendations. You must, you must, um, you know, uh, people were being impacted by health. You know, un you must stop mining until you address these health issues, et cetera. The government of Jamaica ignored it, of course. Um, I am told that they have responded. I've asked for what that response is and I don't know. So the human rights approach has been applied. In terms of the legal approach, um, two constitutional cases. The first one um, in Jamaica in our, um, in our constitution, you have the several rights are granted of which bauxite mining in particular um, abridges. One is you have the right to live anywhere in Jamaica right? Um, you're supposed to be able to move anywhere in the, uh, around in the island as long as you're a legal citizen. Um, bauxite mining, which displaces you and also ruins um, your heritage and where you, the, the very um, reality of where you live absolutely um, abuses that right, right? Because we have a law, it's a law from 1946. Our Mining Act gives all rights minerals to the government. This is typical, it's not unusual, it um, happens all over the world. And once they give permission to a company, meaning give them a lease, they only need to give you two weeks notice and then they can come onto your land and mine, whether you want them to or not, okay? So what happens is, they either in places where they own the land, and how they own the land is very problematic. You know, Mimi's going to talk about land grabs. This was part of the land grabs. What happened was um, bauxite mining was discovered in Jamaica in the 40s when, because of world, so-called World War II, um, all the major war countries were desperately looking for aluminum for the reasons Patsy was talking about. Airplanes, bombs, bullets armory, all of that. So Britain, um, um, bauxite mining was found in a, play, in a parish called St. Anne. And in 1951, the first set of bauxite was, was exported and alumina was exported. So it began quite early in this whole process that we have um, the mining. And so, so what happened was, at one point, the, the main aluminum countries, these were multi, um, you know, they, these were um, glo um, multinational corporations that were vertically integrated, meaning they did every part of the aluminum process. They owned at least 10% of Jamaica. We're talking Alcan, Alcoa, Kaiser, Reynolds, okay? How they got that land, of course, that now they claim to own and can kick you off their land, they would have been going to many, many, many small landholders. Or if you understand the situation of land in Jamaica, after so-called emancipation from enslavement, the slave owners were the ones who were compensated. The enslaved people got nothing, right? So whatever land they, they had, would they have title to it? Who would it have belonged to, et cetera? Yes, there were people who had customary ownership of the land and they had family land. But when the, gov when the, when the companies came to buy their land, right, and they signed something, could they read the document? Was there even a document, right? So the whole question of all this land that the companies own, that people are moved off of or threatened by, um, then that is an issue. But it doesn't matter. Whether you own the land or not, you can be removed. So, um, so the impact is really, really, really drastic. 
So the, let me go with the other. So that's one thing. You have the right to mobility and to live wherever you want. Mm -hmm. There's a right for you to have a clean and productive, um, let me read it to you, the exact wording. It says, uh, the right to enjoy a healthy and productive environment free from the threat of injury or damage from environmental abuse and degradation of the ecological heritage. Okay? So that's another, another right that's in the Constitution that's being cited in these two constitutional cases. Um, the other is, of course, the right to life. Because this, both the alumina industry and bauxite mining, is a threat. Literally, people die. Okay. We have cases of people who have died because um, respiratory illnesses. There are acute illnesses, and then there are illnesses across life. There are cancers that are related, etc. Right. So you're and then there are other human rights that are not necessarily in our constitution, but Jamaica has signed on to. Right. So the constitutional cases are the first of their kind. There also needs to be a constitutional case against the Mining Act itself because it's clearly unconstitutional. Um, so there are two cases that will be ho heard, um, like I said, in November. They'll be, they're separate, but they'll be heard together. The Maroons have brought a case. Um, it hasn't been, they're having a hard time um, you know, document, with all of these cases, documents go strangely missing, you can't find a judge, you know, this kind of nonsense is going on. There's another case um, having to do with um, a, a mining company that has been polluting a river for decades, a river called the Rio Crobe. Um, and there's a case where the fishers, because the, their fish kills every time it, it pollutes the river, the Fishers, along with the Jamaica Environment Trust and some other organizations, are suing the government as well. That case is, these cases are just beginning. The other two constitutional cases have been delayed for at least two years. We're talking about deep inequalities and the connections between industries that we see as contemporary, but um, linking to old inequalities. We're in the post-independence period, right? We have governments. And in the film, what struck me is that you had two former ministers of government who were both um, lamenting the destruction of the environment and the effect of the industry on people's health. Where is the Jamaican government in this? I mean, in the movie, you spoke about um, the attempt by the Jamaican government, which, which ran it afoul of the US to impose, and the bauxite companies, of course, to impose a bauxite levy as a way of getting some of that wealth for Jamaica. So what's the status of the bauxite levy? But also, what is the role of these post-independent governments? <laughs> right, so um, I've just written a piece because it's called um, the Jamaican the government of Jamaica versus the citizens of Jamaica. Because what's happening is, um, as part of these constitutional cases, they asked for an injunction to mining. Because if you have a case that's saying mining is unconstitutional and we must not expand into special mining lease 173, the logic would be that the companies have to stop mining until the case is heard, right? Until there is a, a ruling. Instead, they were still mining, and the concept was that they would just keep delaying and delaying and delaying and postponing the case and, and mine as much as they could, right? The first attempt at injunction failed. The second attempt at injunction, the judge actually gave an injunction on mining, which has never happened in Jamaica, okay? The bauxite companies and the government freaked out, and they have an expedited hearing on the 20th of March this year. And the government is being um, represented by the attorney general, right? 
So the government of Jamaica is actually against its own citizens, right? And this has been the case the entire time, that they have always been in partnership with the industry. They have denied any of the effects. If you go to any of these meetings with the government officials, you can show them video. People stand up and talk, give their own histories and stories and what they have seen and lived. And they're just completely ignored. They said, oh no, that's just anecdotal, or it's not true, or they just keep repeating lies over and over. And even if they admit that there are problems, it has to always be within this balance of the needs of the nation state. The state and what their needs are for, for uh, foreign exchange um, and what they claim are the benefits of the industry outweigh the fact that when you destroy these places, they're gone forever, okay? So, Right now, the government will be siding with the industry as, as they always have against their own people. And given the power of the government, I cannot believe that the judiciary will be able to stand up to them. So I expect the appeal to be, uh, you know, uh, the appeal to be successful and the injunction to be removed. And what you need to understand is that the basis of the appeal is with, if the injunction is not removed, we will go bankrupt. So a private company, right, which has already gone bankrupt, has been famous. they go bankrupt, they switch hands, nothing changes, right? They went bankrupt in 2016, they were re restructured in 2018, they were restructured again, they changed their name, okay? They have their partnership two instead of partnership one, okay? So the suffering and reality of the people of Jamaica and the, the actual place itself is secondary to the profits and earnings of, um, you know, these companies, right? And so when you say, where is the government? The government is on the side of foreign corporations and and on the side of itself, right? So the state and the population are not the same thing. So that the government, you know, certain, we have a system where you just need the minister, you just need to get the minister, okay? That's all you need. So it's beneficial to certain individuals. They can get very wealthy off of this, right? But also, if you think about the people, who are these people? They're throwaway people, they're sacrificable people, right? Somebody riding their donkey and, 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 and you know, growing yam, right? They're of no use to a politician. They can't pay for their campaign. They can't build huge infrastructure that they can siphon money off. They can't build monuments that create their, you know, their greatness. Who are they? They're throwaway people. Well, so that's 95% of Jamaicans are throwaway people, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so that's, that's the relationship. Okay. The bauxite companies, in responding to the injunction that was recently issued by a judge to halt the, the further um, mining of, of bauxite, launch an appeal on the grounds that the judge didn't understand the e economic effects of the industry on the Jamaican economy. And you talk about the right in the Constitution to move freely across Jamaica, but that right is already, you don't have a right in the tourism sector, um, even though there's a right to um, access in the beach from the sea, a lot of hotels actually build in such a way that they block off access to the sea or they police the sea with dogs and guards and, and you know, chase people away. So we're talking about more than, and you, your film on Jamaica for Sale really goes into these issues. So we're talking about not just the mining sector, but a whole developmental strategy, development, quote unquote, 
that is employed in these post-colonial societies that, you know, I wanted to know if you had a comment on it. And there seems to be in that a comment on agriculture and a devaluation of agriculture. So I, I just wanted a comment. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's about the development model always um, and what is valued and what is not valued. So I don't know. I think we might have some of the, well, who knows. But, you know, we have, if you go to, if you've ever been to Jamaica, you know that we have very bad roads, um, except our prime minister is obsessed with highways, so we have all these highways being built. But we have these luxury vehicles, you know? We, we have these luxury vehicles, and uh, it's like, okay, is this where foreign exchange needs to go, right? So the values, I mean, the, the prime minister is obsessed. He's said it over and over. He wants his idea of of, you know, us arriving in modernity is the usual, you know, skyscrapers and highways and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so the, the term used in, in the propaganda by the bauxite companies and by, by the government itself is a few misguided environmentalists are concerned, right? And then they get more kind of violent than that. They basically other you that you're a foreign agent or, you know, some kind of anti anti person of the nation that you are against development. Okay? So the notion of development is is very, very narrow and it completely um, doesn't care. Again, it's not just that you don't have access to the beach. The Beach Act, our Beach Act that was actually made by Norman Manley privatizes the beaches. In Jamaica, the beaches are private, okay? The only access you have is supposedly to be able to walk across the wet part of the beach or some nonsense. And yes, they do put fences all the way in, but even so, right? The beaches are private. There is no public sphere in Jamaica. We just had another, um, um, you know, controversy with one of the, in, in, we have no, almost no green spaces left in Kingston. And one of them is this place called Devon House. Um, and you haven't been able to go on the lawn. <laughs> you haven't been able to go on the lawn for years, okay? And they recently, they recently, and this is the, the Tourist en en Endowment or Improvement Fund or whatever it's called, um, they recently improved it by cutting down trees and paving it. Okay? So you can't go on the lawn if you're an ordinary Jamaican, okay? Only people there who have paid for something or the other are allowed to go there. And then what had been a lovely little place um, has now been destroyed to make way for some kind of entertainment. I, I'm not sure what the concept is, okay? So once you have, and that's why I end my film with the words of Arundhati Roy, where she's talking about the need for not just a different imagination, but to give space for those who have a different imaginary, right? And in Jamaica, there is no space for those, you know. So my footage of us demonstrating a huge amount of people going to parliament, who were they, you know? Rastafari, Marcus Garvians, you know? Um, we have a new indigenous Taino, we have a new cacique, um, maroons, um, hippies, <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, the Jamaican equivalent of hippies, you know, um, the concerned elite, right? You know? Who, the government doesn't care about any of this. It's not threatened in any way, but it's threatened now because they're actual legal cases that it has to pay attention to, right? So the question is, if you have people who don't care, as um, I interviewed um, Gloria Sims, who is the Maroon spiritual leader, um, she said, if you know these things, and you still continue to do them, you don't care. And so clearly, right, we have a poli political class that does not care. 
So if you have a political class that does not care, what influences them to make change? That is the ultimate question. Wow, that's a, a very important question. And I, I just want to add on the whole question of um, development strategies and the lack of attention to the environment, the Chinese attempts to build ports and the Goat Island, um, you know, the activism around Goat Island. Right, so, you know, we're, we're part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and I have a short film that's on my YouTube channel um, that's called um, uh, something ridiculous like um, I, um, <laughs> I Live for Art, an ecocide romance. And I documented the three years that this was the first um, we have China Harbor Engineering Corporation um, this was the first. This was the first major. They they built the stadiums in the in the West Indies during the the cricket, <laughs> the cricket cup. That was absurd. Um, so they built a stadium in a place that nobody goes, and it's never been used except maybe as a, as a cow pasture. That's not their fault. That's that was a political issue. That was chosen by the minister who wanted it in his district. Um, and then the first major infrastructure project they did was this highway that goes to the airport. So it, it's about a mile and something that goes from the roundabout to the airport. And the minister then said that it was going to, it's just nonsense. They just say nonsense. It's just unbelievable crap. And um, so I documented the whole thing, and you can see that there, the kind of things that are said. It, it was... Um, it was to save the environment was why they were doing it. I was just in, in the Lower East Side of, of New York, and the same thing has happened. They've cut down a 1,000 trees for a climate uh, mitigation adaptation project where they're going to save flooding and whatnot. And this was the same thing. Um, the dunes save the place. The mangroves save the place. They destroyed all of it and built... Um, you know, rock revetments and all this kind of nonsense. And the person who was gaining personally, because his, his personally owned um, machines were being rented to do this work, um, says in the film that they're saving nature from itself because acts of nature such as hurricanes, they were saving it from acts of nature such as hurricanes and tsunamis um, ex because nature was destructive, okay? So that was the first, and then there's a highway that is owned by the Chinese um, and that is being expanded. The first highway we have is owned by the French. These are toll roads. Um, this is how we, we pay for these things. Um, so they wanted to do a transshipment port, just like they wanted to do a transshipment port in various places, because we are, we are, I don't know if you know where Jamaica is, but it's very, you know, Panama is right there. And Jamaicans helped to build the Panama Canal, and it was being expanded, and the bigger ships, China was looking for a transshipment port. And there was an, we had an island called Goat Islands that was just off the coast. But it had actually been the site, I think, of a U.S. landing strip in World War, whatever, whatever. So it was, you know, just another, another form of, you know, settler colonialism. But... Um, it was fought, it was fought locally, nationally, and internationally, and they, they gave it up. And I don't, I tend to think it wasn't because of our actions. I think if they really wanted to do it, they would have done it. I think something else was going on why they didn't do it. But they, um, they continued to build roads and, and other things, yeah. Can you tell me what you're working on now? You started, <laughs> <laughs> and I know you're not sitting still. Well, no, no, I mean, I've, I've, no, I've just, it's just a continuity. I've been, I've been doing this documenting and organizing ag against this extractive industries in Jamaica for about 20 years. And um, so the latest one I mentioned was this borderline justice project um, um, that this Swedish academic um, has, is doing for five years. And so I'm making this film that's looking at this question of protected areas and sacrifice zones. And what's happened is that as we were able to, every time we were able to stop the movement west of mining, they just went back 
and mined more and more intensely where they had already been mining. So for those of you who saw my film, you'll see that Dr. Green's land was mined. His father had not sold back in the 70s when Kaiser Bauxite was mining the area, and that was all that was left. Well, they, they, they went back and mined places that they had not mined before. They went back and mined places that they had mined, etc. So the more that we protected Coptic country, the worse it got for the people of St. Anne. Right? And so one of the solutions that has been given for the protection and the protected area of Coptic country is, you know, declare it a national park and you know, a world heritage site and all these kind of things, right? But if you interrogate national parks, you know, there are often places where indigenous people are just removed or there are places where the state just takes control and decides what can happen there, such as giving mining. I mean, I was in Chile <laughs> going to, the, I mean, Chile and your national parks are a trip, an absolute trip. Can you find them? Do they exist? Is anyone there? Private concessions? You know? It was like, what? How is this a national park? So we, we sometimes think that certain things are helping, you know? We think, oh, obviously, a national park, a preservation zone, a conservation zone, a something, 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 right? But it just gives more and more power to the state to decide who can be there, and what happens there, you know? And so this film, Borderline Justice, is looking at one side, which is this question of place, right? Who decides where this is and what can happen there? And then this question of justice. So it's looking at all the efforts, you know, over the decades of people to have justice and not receive justice. And then it will follow the, the legal cases and, and that kind of thing. So it's just a, you know, the next, just a continuation of the work I've been doing. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Figaro. I would like to open um, the, yeah, up to the audience. Those of you online, please send us your questions and comments. And before we go to the first question, I would like to acknowledge the presence of associate producer on the film, Dr. Mimi Scheller, who is in the audience and who will be on um, a panel later on today. Um, Brian Meeks, I saw you first and then, then I come, yes. Wait, hold on, a mic is coming your way. <laughs> Thank you, Patsy, for organizing this um, with your team, and Esther for welcome, and um, I really appreciated it. Two quick comments. The first is in relation to the government of Jamaica. Um, this is obviously very much in the film, but in your comment, you say the government of Jamaica, and I think the word you use, has never. And um, you, yet in the film, you speak about the Michael Manley government of 1972 to 1980 which actually not only gestured towards a different approach to bauxite, but actually began to do some things. So I would love to hear a little more on, on the government as a, as a broad term, as opposed to particular governments. And of course, more recent governments, I think it applies entirely, but I'd like to hear more on that. The second question really is, um, uh, you kind of pointed out the nature of your alliance Right? And that alliance, an alliance of environmental activists, an alliance of hip, your word, hip is not mine. Um, and um, obviously, this hasn't reached beyond the people in the cockpit country or around it itself, a sort of deep resonance with the Jamaican people. No, it has. I'll, well, I'll speak okay. about that. Okay, please, please do. But, what I'm not hearing is the politics going forward. What are the political, what is the political direction that can actually change things? And what does that, and this is a bigger question, and I, it does, you don't have to answer this here. What does that change look like? Hmm. So um, let me start with the, first, the second, um, the alliance. No, actually, Cockpit Country is the most successful movement in Jamaica, okay? 
there is no other movement as successful as Coptic country. The only thing that would unite Jamaicans as much would be sports um, or, or, or music or something, okay? Um, the Coptic country effort is the most successful movement in Jamaica. Um, it's not only probably 99.9% .9 of Jamaicans support not just um, efforts at Coptic country, but most Jamaicans are now against extraction, okay? This was not the case back in the days that you're talking about, and I'll refer to the Man Michael Manning government shortly. So um, this has been going on for decades. It is internal, not just to Coptic country, but people all around Jamaica now have a feeling about Coptic country and support Coptic country, whether they know where it is or whether they've been there or not. Not just that, it's now one of the most studied places, okay? There's so many PhDs and masters and people coming to do. Vice News has done several successful million um, watched films, okay, about the issue of mining in Jamaica. One called, two, a series called Jamaica for Sale, actually. So, um, no, Coptic country is the most successful movement. And in terms of politics, as I've said, what do you mean by politics? In terms of the politics of people and um, their own agency, this has been an exact example of people and their own agency, whether they're maroons, whether they're um, not, whether they're um, farmers, whether they're not. The problem is that the government doesn't give a fuck, okay? So how do you make the government give a fuck? right? Um, these legal cases are the first, but it would require that entities that pay, the, that, that, that individual politicians have to suffer, okay? Individual politicians who are kleptomaniacs, okay, have to have their money and their, re and their assets taken from them, okay? They have to be stripped of their power, all right? So, uh, until the government is something other than what it is, all right, there's no point. It will always be what it is. In terms of the Michael Manley government in the 70s, what happened was, and you will see that the film is, is dedicated to Michael Schwartz, who was head of Windsor Institute, and sadly, we miss him, terribly died, and to Gervon, Norman Gervon. Um, I interviewed three of the people who uh, were negotiated the bauxite levy. What this was, was what happened was when bauxite first started in Jamaica and Norman Manley, they uh, ch was charging uh, the major mu multilateral, um, multinational corporations what was basically a shilling a ton, okay? something like 20 cents a ton, okay? That went up to the equivalent of a dollar a ton, whoopee, all right? So the Manly, the son, Michael Manley's approach was a nationalist approach, okay? And this is the national approach which makes currently in Guyana going to be the, the largest producer of fossil fuels in the world. The idea isn't that there's a problem with extraction. The idea is that the problem is with extractivism, all right? The problem is that the, the nation does not benefit. The people don't benefit, right? The people, there's no people being extracted who can benefit, all right? So the idea was that the companies would have to pay a proper amount. So the bauxite levy was brought in. So that meant you didn't just pay uh, a royalty, right? You know, a dollar a ton or something. But you would always, because you would always have to pay, you know, this additional amount. And it brought quite a bit of money into the government for about two years. The question is, where did that money go? Which is a whole nother story, okay? And in response to that, of course, um, the major corporations, Alcan, et cetera, et cetera, who already had plans, they already had, you know, they were already in, in, in Ghana and in Guinea and in Australia and in Brazil and Vietnam and wherever they could be, right? 
the other thing that the Manly government did was they 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 set up this <laughs> this bauxite these bauxite com, uh, countries right they were trying to do what had what the oil uh, oil countries had do it right you set up a cartel so they tried to set up a a bauxite cartel where they would all stand together right and demand you know a proper price and proper um, practices and whatnot of course that didn't work because for example the Australian government had had a liberal government and were in it and then they changed a conservative government and they went their own way and everyone fell apart right and as Beverly Manley says in the film when they went to Cuba for the um, non-aligned movement and she said all the wealth was in the room right all the wealth was in the room but could people come together? What, one, of the main, one of the downfalls for the Manly government was the, was the whole oil crisis, right? And he went and begged, you know, give us a break, right? No break was given, okay? So what I'm saying is with the Manly government, what they were trying to do was so that the nation, right, would benefit from the resources that were being extracted. But they were not stopping extraction and the impacts of extraction on the people. What was supposed to happen with the levy was that that money was supposed to then go back into the community, theoretically, right? So that those who were sacrificed would have some benefit, right? So that you could, you know, you would have, I don't know, um, you know, better health care and, and those sorts of things. What happened as time went on, as the government, you know, the, the companies left Jamaica, right, and used the bauxite levy as the excuse, and then the whole industry's changed, and, you know, Mimi has written a whole book about this, Aluminum Dreams. It, it changed from this vertically integrated to all sorts of, you know, um, venture capitalism and a completely different system of investing. So, so the companies, the old, in the old days, it was a company town. Alcan did everything. It was all there, right? No, now you go in, you cherry pick, you, you just do one thing, you do it at the cheapest, you get the maximal profit, and you leave. So right now, um, and I sent, I sent Patsy this article by the London um, Mining Network, where they break down how much money the companies are actually paying to the government of Jamaica, all right? Versus how much is claimed that we're getting. So the solution for me, unlike the majority of people in the Caribbean, is not that the nation benefit better from extraction, but that they not be extraction. So for me, it's not just a matter of extractivism, it's a matter of extraction itself. Mm -hmm. But you, there's a little bit of a contradiction there, because you said that um, in response to that question, that we need to get rid of the individual um, kleptocrats. Mm -hmm. in government. But this is beyond individual tech, um, clip. No, no, he was clip. asking about what, the politics of it. Okay. But it seemed to me How that... How do you influence yeah. the politics? As long as... as, yeah, long but it as seems like there is a vision problem, that there's a lack of vision in, in the Caribbean about what a, what a future can look like and what the place of these traditional industries Correct. could be, which goes beyond... Um, the craven politician who is just in it, and there are lots of them in it for their 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 own. Right, but um, I mean, you know, we. And the question is, how we get there? No? How, how do you how do you change your imaginary? No, most of us enjoy most of us enjoy the comforts of of life, and who's going to give up the comforts of life? The hippies in Jamaica. <laughs> okay, there's a question at the back, and then to me. <laughs> well. Rastafari. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Go on. No. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to ask you two questions. Question number one For those families, are, are for does the corporations or the government pay for their relocation expenses? And then, secondly, when you talk about foreign corporations, are they primarily U.S. corporations? And if so, has there been any movement to their boards or the approach to U.S. federal government to uh, accountable for their behavior? Um, one, of, 
one of the tactics of, of other entities has been to um, buy stocks and, and um, do the board thing. And I think um, that's been tried successfully with Exxon recently. Um, in terms of Jamaica, um, the who Jamaica's in partnerships, okay? So for example, um, Jamaica is 51% owner, so they're the, the majority owner in the partnership. Um, then we have, in terms of the bauxite companies, um, tracing kind of where is no longer the point, right? Because it's, you know, if you have an office, I mean, it's an office in London. Um, Gisco is now owned by um, Alpard is now owned by Gisco, which is a Chinese um, uh, state-owned corporation. Um, we have um, uh, a Russian, famous Russian uh, oligarch owned. Um, you know, so it's it's all over the place um, in terms of, and these are not. Um, you know, some of them are really sort of, um, they're, they're, there was one that was owned by the Noble Group, which was a kind of English Hong Kong thing that had a, a kind of speculative market type thing that had an incredible fall. They lost millions, billions in a year and collapsed. And their only asset is in Jamaica, okay? It's a alumina refinery. Um, so yeah, that I know that that thing about um, as for the federal government of the U.S. Um, in my film, you have Donald Trump trying to bring back the aluminum industry. So um, he was willing to put tariffs, actually. Um, so that's that. So that um, that that might not work so well um, in terms of people who are displaced. Um, what will happen sometimes is a company, so if you've heard of um, Usain Bolt, the great runner, his family, how he got in cockpit country, um, and this is, if you go to my YouTube channel and watch um, cockpit country voices from Jamaica's heart, his aunt Lillian Bolt tells a story of how they were moved from Lime Tree Garden in St. Anne into the middle of nowhere in cockpit country in what was then Windsor and then Sherwood Content. What happened was Kaiser owned thousands of acres in Coptic country, and they moved them from one place to the other. Um, so what happens is people are moved um, from where they are to somewhere else. Um, compensation is random. It is based on um, individual negotiating with the company. There's one person who does it. Um, he plays everybody off each other. Um, and one thing I haven't talked about is the strategies of the government, uh, uh, well, the government, uh, the companies, which completely surveil, control, and um, terrorize these communities. Um, and so it becomes very, very hard in Jamaica um, to actually stand up against the government or against corporations, you're likely to be shot. You're likely to be killed. You're likely to be chased out of the community. You're likely to be vilified. You're likely to lose your mind, at least. Sorry that Tony had a question. Yeah. Um, can you just introduce yourselves at the start? So, yeah, there's a mic. Yeah, yeah Tony Boggs, um, and I teach at Brown. Um, good to see you, Esther. Hi. <laughs> um, and to say congratulations on the film. I really liked it. So, so. <clears throat> a, a couple of things, though, that I was, I was wondering about. Um, you mentioned that, like, Mandible, let's just take Mandible, was a company town. And uh, I wondered why, and a film can't do everything, but I wondered why the ways in which the bauxite company operated white racism even in these places is not something that we also need to think about. Um, 
and uh, I'm thinking here of a story I heard of four weeks ago in Jamaica um, of a young man who took his father to a house that the Bauxite Company used to own to celebrate his 80th birthday and the man was just crying because he used to work at the company he could not go into that house and he was just, you know, he just broke down. Um, and so the, 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 the question therefore of um, a certain kind of extractive capitalism that also is racialized um, might be something that we, you know, we want to think about. And so that is in, in terms of even the, even the arguments that we make, uh, you know, which a lot of times is focused on the environment and so on and so forth. And I agree with you with the cockpit is not say it's most successful, I say it's one of the most important movements, uh, I would argue, um, <laughs> at the moment. Um, no, because success would mean that certain things have happened and we're still, we still fighting. Um, that the business of, <clears throat> of race, or race and color work, and how, therefore how these companies operate, um, historically and still operate, I think, is, I, I think just might, that might be important. And then I just want to raise one other point um, and that is um, whether or not um, what efforts are made to uh, incorporate bauxite workers in the in in, in, in whatever is, is happening. And I want to ra I raise that just from a, a historical experience of when years ago we were trying to think about ditching the sugar industry because you know it. Lome wasn't working, blah, 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 blah. Um, they, 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 one of the considerations was the thousands of workers that you would put out of mm -hmm. work and what that meant, mm -hmm. um, but also not just politically, but what that meant mm -hmm. economically for a, a particular you know, places, from, mm -hmm. et cetera. Right. Um, and then to, to couldn't get anybody to agree that this is that you you had to do it in a phased way, so mm -hmm. you had to retrain workers and mm -hmm. so on, and then and so and then nobody was began to talk to the workers, right? and so I, I'm I'm just thinking that whether or not that's a kind of if it's a missing equation, I don't okay. know the full story. Let me, let me answer. Yeah. Fine. Okay, so um, I had I had many stories that were to happen and didn't, or um, I have. So there was somebody who actually lives in a bauxite house now, very middle-class person. Um, and she was supposed to be part of the story and talking about how she was living there now, et cetera. And she disappeared and that never happened. Um, in terms, I have an interview with someone who, um, part of what, um, I have many interviews that are not in the film, and um, part of what's supposed to happen is a digital archive that's supposed to have this information. I have an, I have an interview with someone who explains the racial breakdown of who was what and where a black person could reach at the time, et cetera. That's not the case now, okay? So in terms of the history, um, of course, upper management was white. Um, in terms of the kind of professionals who were working in the alumina industry who were scientists. You had chemists, you had um, administrators, you had all sorts of people. Those were all brown, the lawyers, um, some were Chinese, etc. And then you had what were then the best paying jobs for black men, okay? And some of those were um, had to, some were technical, but many were, have, had to do with like large machinery and stuff like that. And I interviewed someone who had worked for many, many years in the bauxite industry and hated it and had a lot to say about it. Unfortunately, he has passed, but I have his interview and some other workers, um, one who loved it um, from Clarendon. Um, he was able to then have his own business. He had buses and, and cars and trucks and stuff. So um, in terms of what you're talking about with Frome and the changes in the industry, we've been calling forever to have an exit plan, right? Have an exit plan and decide what's happening. In fact, the, the um, labor unions to, that have controlled the, um, the bauxite workers 
rather than advocating for workers generally, okay, there have been many, many times when they could have had alliances with other workers and made sure that others' workers' wages went up and they chose not to, okay? They chose to have their narrow self-influence interests and they're very, and at that, that time, there were a very small number of workers, okay, who had that elite status, right? That has changed completely. Now it's all outsourced, right? There are very few workers that are actually employed by the company, right? Most are contract workers. So, for example, when Alpart was reopened after it was closed by um, the Russian company, um, what's it called again? Rosal. Rosal had it shuttered for eight years or so, okay? And when JISCO opened it and it was reopened, right, it stayed open for a year. They promised it was going to be an industrial park, it was going to employ 10,000 people or some nonsense, okay? It was open for a year, it employed 400 people, and they were immediately left laid off. They don't have any work, all right? And I used to take the route taxi when I went to St. Elizabeth, and those people were coming from Mandeville. They were not employed because Nain is in the middle of nowhere, and they're all rural and farm workers, right? So the issue about the, who the workers are, who represents them, and how it re represents to solidarity generally with Jamaican workers, I would say that the bauxite union and the bauxite workers when the, we had the protest on Parliament, the company bust the workers in, okay? They also had their own demonstration in front of JET that the company bust them in for and put them up in the hotel and stuff like that. But I agree with Tony completely, all right? Currently, most of the workers are basically, they're driving trucks, they're truck drivers, and they're large equipment um, you know, operators. So what is the alternative to driving trucks and being large equipment operators? Well, you can do that anywhere, right? There's so much, um, you know, there are you know, they're, they're jobs for truck drivers and bus drivers and whatnot all over the place. And large equipment, um, whatnot, um, is being used as we speak for building highways, et cetera, et cetera. Those kind of jobs are very transferable, right? Um, growing yam <laughs> and growing food, which you can no longer grow because there's no mother land, is not transferable. There was yes, more? Jose and then Kate. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Patsy, for the seven. Esther, nice to meet you. I love love the film, the, thank you very much, the movie. Um, I am Jose Miguel, I'm Colombian, uh, I work in Brazil and I'm here uh, as a visiting professor in the CLAX, at the CLAX. Um, I, I, I was uh, thinking maybe in, in other layer, uh, it's like some more maybe more poetic layer of your movie that take us to the moon and take us to this country so i think that that uh, i i was mobilized by your movie in thinking the infinite capacity of kill this country have and this country have uh, around the world uh, and, uh, and and thinking in your research in the the, the 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 relation of this capacity this uh, to kill with with, with uh, the the fantasies about the moon about mars about the special exploration and to uh, this movement of destroying life and destroying a planet you know? so uh, i i was it's like another la layer of the movie that I was taken by the poetry of your movie, um, which is politics, of course. And I was thinking about uh, this in connection with the uh, gold exploring in Brazil, for example, and in Colombia. Um, uh, I, I was uh, taken to, to uh, places that I know in Colombia and Brazil which are very similar of, of the scenes that you show in, in Jamaica, 
uh, and, and, and the relation with the workers, with the local workers, that it's so complex. Uh, because it's a, it's a process uh, of producing poverty and producing suffering, but of producing fantasies and dependence. Or so, so I don't know. I, I just want to, to, to thank you. And, and I, I maybe I, I want to put these two uh, things together for conversation. The, 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 the poetics of the, of the movie which take us to this country and, and their fantasies and these destructive fantasies. So it's like that, Esther, thank you. Thank you. Have you noticed that you've been influenced by being in Brazil? That your language has been influenced? Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, was was there anything you wanted me to address, or did you just want no, to say? No. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Kate has a, a question. Um, I have a question that's actually from Lucas Gonzalez, who's one of the other panelists who will be speaking a little bit later. He's asking, are there divisions within the communities, people very much against mining and others supporting it? Can you please talk for a moment about this? And if there are divisions, how much they favor companies and the government? Yes, there are divisions, and one of the strategies of the company is to create divisions. Um, so in many of these communities, we're talking very small rural communities where everyone knows each other and has known each other for generations, and um, where there are certain levels of trust. In fact, in my... F um, I can't remember whether I put it in the film, but Peter Bunting, who was a minister, when I interviewed him, he talked, he gave the, I don't think it's in the film, but he gave a very specific example of a woman who used to sell, and um, she knew everyone, so she, she could, on, on basis of trust, right? So if you didn't have any money today, she would sell it to you, knowing that she would, you know, get the money later, et cetera, et cetera. What happened was when she was displaced to somewhere else where she didn't know the people and whatnot, she didn't, she didn't know the level of trust, so she, she, couldn't, she couldn't run her, her small little you know, business in the same kind of way and not only end up, ended up impoverished in terms of material impoverishment, but you end up in spiritual and... and, and um, communal impoverishment, right? Where you, you can't trust people or you don't know or you don't know how to, to act, right? So one of the things that happens is that y you can't even imagine it. There's one person, and I won't say his name because of defamation law, but he's a person that everyone calls. So when you talk to them and you say, well, have you been offered any compensation? They say, yeah, man, I talked to so-and-so, and he -so promised me this, but I can't reach him on the phone, and blah, 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 and I hear Sam give that person that, and then they go and find out, oh, yeah, that person got that, but I only got this, okay? They have something called dust nuisance, all right? In Jamaica, we use this word nuisance, which is a British terminology, okay? So something that sends you to the hospital is called a nuisance, all right? And people get every, for a family of whatever size, um, like every two months or three months or something, they get the equivalent of um, not even 100 US. I can't even translate how much it is. It's a, like 2,000 Jamaican, um, whatever, whatever, depending, okay? For an entire family, okay? The, the, the medications that they take cost 50 times more than that, right? They have to buy bottled water because they can't drink the water that they normally have. They can't go and find food. They can't gather food. It doesn't exist anymore, and they can't plant it, all right? So people are immediately thrown into disarray, and those that have the abilities, the capacity, leave. And who is left? The most vulnerable, the most desperate, the most dependent. And so... What happens is the, the company does bribes with people. It gives some people more than others. It has spies, okay? It has people following you around and threatening you and threatening other people. So, yes, 
You have people who are for it because maybe they work in industry, maybe they drive a truck or whatever, but even if they don't. So for example, at one of the, um, the bogus EIA hearing when they had to do, um, they had to do their, um, you have to do at the end of it, you have to do a public thing where you describe what the EIA is and what et cetera, et cetera. It was on Zoom because of, um, of, of the pandemic, but they also had small little places in the communities where people gathered. The company controlled who was there in many places. They brought their own people in and they wouldn't let anybody else speak or get in there. And online we had these running like battles with people who were clearly planted by the government, who were saying all these things and you know discrediting, I mean by the, by the companies. So you have people who genuinely, okay, believe this is their vision of, of progress and, they, and development and they benefit in some kind of way. And then you have people who are intimidated and terrorized, right? And then you have people who are being manipulated because they're desperate. So you have a range, always a range of people. But the kind of strategies that are going on are um, incredibly brutal. Um, you know, one person tried to physically stop the bulldozers coming on his land, and he was shot by the security, the company's security guard, and run out of the community. And many of the community members were saying that he, they, that was correct, that was the right thing that should happen to him, because he was would interrupt them getting their dust nuisance money. That's how in Jamaica people are desperate and. When people are desperate, it's very easy, right, to make people hard-hearted and, and, and to not think in collective terms. Okay. We have a question here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, I'm, and thank you, Patsy, for organizing this. Um, I'm very curious about the, um, the role of law, the role of uh, the legal system somehow apparently kind of facilitating uh, or creating a new or new arena where maybe long term but somehow successful small steps are happening. And I mean the contrary seems like conservation attempts, right? Or 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 projects trying to conserve nature in the in the kind of more traditional way are becoming just another tool for governments to kind of say we're doing something, right? But kind of working around extractivism, right? Uh, I Trying, I'm trying to identify, right, where are those spaces where this is more effective for collective action, and, and I think the legal sphere, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in my presentation later today. I'm, I'm fascinated and very interested in that, in that aspect, and I would love to hear more about how you see that process, right, kind of shifting the arenas where that, those, those attempts to respond, to contest, to negotiate, extractivism are appearing, are appearing more effectively. Right, so as you know, the legal system is very expensive and very time-consuming, right? And um, one of the lawyers who has been doing the most intimate work in terms of getting testimonies from people, etc., cetera, um, the company is accusing her of coercing people and um, is going around telling communities not to talk to her, okay? So the actual process is difficult, it's extensive. Um, you're representing people who have no money and no means, and so it has to be pro bono, et cetera, et cetera, right? Meanwhile, the companies have each have the teams of the top lawyers, okay? And there are three companies plus the attorney general, okay, versus you and your people who are afraid for their lives, okay? At any moment, the government could, con could, could I mean, the, well, the government or the companies could convince any of those people to drop out, right? So the balance to start with, legally, right? But the incredible efforts on the part of these sorts of people, yes, is moving this forward. But the legal framework itself, right, the Mining Act, it's not just the Mining Act, it's all these other acts, but fundamentally, it is the political system, the Westminster system that we have, that is, which is also a, a colonial system, meaning that the ministers have more power. They're like mini kings, mini dictators, right? 
So the law says you must do X, Y, and Z, but it also says at the, of the minister, right? So the technical staff, there was recently a case where the technical staff said no, right? You should not do uh, limestone mining in this place. And the prime minister just said, mm -mm, you know, because it was, uh, 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 you know, crony capitalism, right? So you would have to have major constitutional change, right? I'm not just talking using the constitution that we have to, to you know, the human rights and things like that that's currently happening, yes. You'd have to have constitutional change about the power of our rulers. So right now the government has refused to have local elections, okay? Because they say they have no money to have local elections. But they called the last election in the middle of the pandemic when there was community spread and only about 30% voted. And in Jamaica anyway, people's votes are bought, okay? So the entire so-called democratic system is completely corrupt and doesn't serve anybody. So you'd have to have a complete change in governance, all right? And then the legal framework would need to change as well. At the same time, as you're saying, there are spaces that are being used, okay, by incredibly hardworking and devoted and committed people who are risking their life to do that. Okay, I think we have to uh, bring this really fascinating discussion to a close. And Esther, can I announce that we'll allow the film to be seen for one more day for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, and can you tell them how to that. access it? Um, Kate? Okay, we'll come back later on. Kate, where Esther is allowing the film to be up for a day longer. So if um, we can have some information on how people can access it then, that would be good. We can give this later on um, in the discussion, but <laughs> thank you. Yes. I want to say, uh, something that is exercising my mind is that quotation, saving nature from itself. I'm still <laughs> trying to wrap my mind around it. But thank you so very much. And again, I also want to acknowledge, um, which I didn't before, the Clark's team in particular, Kate Goldman, our manager, and Emily Rubelman, our outreach coordinator, and the Watson Communications team, um, including those like Alex who are behind the glass box and who keep us running. So um, thank you very much. Yes, this one. Yes, this is one. Okay.